think about the profound influence of the Bible on the world, the way that it has shaped our culture, whether you're a follower of Christ or not, it's probably a good idea that you know at least what it says. It's going to be about us taking and reading the Bible. Welcome to the Take and Read Podcast. Pastor Chad here, and joining me again is Linnea Morris. Hey, everyone. We, uh, it's been a few weeks since you were on, and I believe last time we had uh, Huckabee. We had yeah. August with us, so yeah. that it was kind of the three of us having conversation, which was fun. Yeah. Uh, but it's back to just the two of us, and uh, I want to get caught up. And I'm, I've started to change the nature of the question that I ask my returning guests. Before it was, you know, what's God teaching you kind of, you know, in your time in the Word. But I'm going to frame it just a little bit differently. Okay. So what is something you've learned recently that you get excited to teach others or to let others know about? Ooh, so much stuff. Okay. Um, I think one practical thing that I've been doing differently that I wish I would have implemented earlier on is I have started reading uh, scripture in different versions. So uh, for example, I am an avid phone scroller in the morning mm -hmm. and it's, it's a habit I really want to break. So I uh, normally I wake up, I get my phone off the charger and I'm checking notifications and I hate that. So what I've been doing is I'll still check notifications, but then I don't get sucked in the black hole of scrolling. <laughs> uh, but I'll open the Bible app and I'll read a Psalm uh, in the NIV, which is what I grew up with. And I feel like because hmm. I've grown up with it, I oftentimes when I'm reading it or even hearing it, it becomes white noise. I don't have it memorized, but mm. when it's read, my brain switches off because I've heard it so much. So I'll read a Psalm in the NIV and try not to go in that autopilot mode. And then I'll read that same Psalm in the message version. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, which is very different from the NIV, right. but it, the way that it's worded and translated is is very different. So when I read those parallel together, uh, scripture means a lot more to hmm. me and I'm able to kind of bounce back and forth. So I think what I'm realizing, I grew up in it for some reason in my brain, I was like, NIV is the only way, right. but it's not. Uh, the Bible that I have right now is ESV mm -hmm. and I have an NIV at home. And so anyways, just the different translations, I think we can get stuck in one translation, but seeing the value of reading different translations, comparing those together for sure. And God speaks. It's cool. Yeah. There is that ability to kind of compare and see a different way it's phrased or a different word and you're like oh that's interesting i wonder mm -hmm. what that and then you add something like the message and so for folks who are listening that may not know what that reference is the message is a paraphrase of the bible and it was produced by one man named eugene peterson who actually is a native yeah of this very valley in yeah. which we live but eugene peterson he didn't um claim to produce a translation his goal was to give a, a contemporary paraphrase of the ideas in scripture. And so it is an interesting approach. Uh, it will definitely force you to think through, is that how I took that, mm -hmm. that statement or that story? Wow. Okay. And it forces you to kind of rethink it mm -hmm. and process it. And so I think it's helpful. Uh, people will, I think, like you said, have a tendency to to just be committed to a particular translation and then they become kind of, I don't know if prejudice is the right word, but they, yeah. they kind of look at other translations yeah. as mm, subpar or yep. something like that. I went, I went through a phase like that where my first Bible was an NIV mm -hmm. and it was a student study Bible. Yep. And then I got to college and I was all about the NASB. Okay. Because the NIV is is more thought for thought in translation, and the NASB was this translation that really prioritized the literal word for word yep. from the Greek to the English. And I was like, oh, man, it's the only way to go. But it was kind of <laughs> choppy, and it yeah. was more difficult to read. And then other translations came out that tried to be a little bit more in between those. But I typically enjoy the NIV for Old Testament studies mm -hmm. uh, because the Hebrew language is a more thought for thought kind of way of doing things, whereas Greek is a little bit more technical. And so 
something like the ESV or the NASB can be helpful when reading the New Testament. So I love it. I'm, yeah. yeah, it's it's a great challenge to listen and. Yeah. Would you say that um, you have more scriptures memorized in the NIV than oh, anything? Definitely. Because that was what you yes. grew up with? All okay. of my scripture, not, probably not all. 90% of the scripture that I have memorized is NIV because that's what the version used yeah. at the Christian school I went to. And yeah. so all the scripture that we memorized, it's NIV. Yeah. <laughs> and do you see, are you one of those that sits there and as somebody rattles off a, a, a passage that you've memorized or you yeah. know, and you go, oh, that's not quite how it goes. <laughs> Cause you're like, oh, that's different. Uh, I do think the different versions that we have, there's so many, uh, that almost helps us with, with scripture memorization. When someone is rattling off a scripture, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, that's different than what I thought. Maybe it's a different version. I might not be in the wrong. Right. It's probably a different version. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah. Uh, so you're you're learning lots through the different translations. Yeah. And so how do you encourage, like, what do you want to encourage people with when you think about that? Oh, I I think uh, for myself, I was finding myself in a, in a rut. Mm -hmm. And so I would hear um, different Psalms, like, let's say Psalm 23, I'm doing a study on that with some friends and we talk about how we have heard that so many times that when right. you start hearing it, you just, you, it's white noise, you don't listen and you're just kind of go on autopilot. But when I read that in a different version, it it's worded so differently that it makes me rethink um, how I meditate on, the script, on that scripture. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just encourage people uh, don't get stuck in a rut. Or if you feel like if you don't understand a certain scripture passage, it can be so helpful to read different versions of that same scripture passage and put them together. And then that will help you comprehend mm -hmm. what you're reading. Yeah. Another question I have for you. You mentioned sometimes your brain going on autopilot. Every day, Do all day. Do you notice it in the moment? Like how often is it oh. you recognize, oh, there I was again, yeah, and then you try to course correct, or is it in? It's not until you're done with your time yeah. in the word, and you're like, wow, I no. don't actually know what I was just looking at. Because I, on road trips, I can drive mm -hmm. and realize I don't remember what I've oh, been yeah. looking at for yeah. the last hour. Where? Yep. How am I still on the road? Yeah. Because your mind just goes. So, how do you? when you recognize it, how do you try to force yourself into mental mm -hmm. engagement? Yeah. Um, that's probably something that I've developed since becoming a mom. There were, there was a <laughs> season where I just realized I do so much on autopilot and I'll be listening to something and I am 100% not in the room. Like mm -hmm. I am not aware of what's happening or even reading. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading something and then I'll stop and think, Oh my gosh, like I don't even I've been thinking about a whole nother conversation while I'm reading. I'm still reading in my brain the words, but then I'm having this separate conversation in my head, which is just so crazy. Um, so I do notice it in the moment. I think one thing for the Psalm things that I've been doing in the morning, one thing that I've been doing is I've been, um, I'll read it on my phone and I will copy and paste maybe a verse or two and put it in my notes app. And then I will pray through that scripture uh, it just keeps my mind busy mm -hmm. and focused, but I'm not falling asleep when I'm mm -hmm. awake in the morning. Um, but for that, I'm just thinking, okay, I try to put myself back in when the scripture was written and how, what would that look like for David as he's writing the Psalm? Mm -hmm. What does that look like for me? And I try to make it very personalized to myself of what, like, what does this mean for me? Why am I reading this? Right. Why is it in the Bible? There's a reason I try to understand why. Gotcha. I think you bring up a good point too of when you turn to praying the text mm -hmm. that you've just read, which that may for some people kind of sound like, how, how do you do that? But simply going back through the passage and then identifying what are some things in this passage that provoke, hey, I need to pray about that. Or there's an attitude here that is something I need to adopt, or there's a, a sin here that I need to avoid, or there's a promise I need to hold on to. Man, there's a something that this scripture tells me about God and his character that I just want to praise in the moment. So I think, like you said, finding something else besides reading, but to accompany the reading 
that forces me to rethink it and to kind of rehash or meditate on it. Journaling is one of those things that kind of goes in and out of my life and I'm in a season where I journal now. Mm -hmm. And I've I've adopted this method that I've heard about for a long time called the SOAP method. Yep. And so just simply on one page of my journal, I write, if I've read a very long section, like I've read a couple of chapters, I will find a particular verse or two that resonate. And so I force myself to go back through and go, Man, what is the the nugget here? Or what's the main point? And then I write that scripture. So that's the S. And then I'll observe and kind of chew on that verse a little bit. Why is that significant? Why did that stand out to me? What what do I need to do here? And so then I write some observations. That's the O. And then I have to think, okay, how do I apply this? How do I live this out? That's the A. And then the P is pray. I'm going to pray this passage. And, you know, so good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. We are in the book of Acts. We're going to finish out chapter 14 today. So the last several episodes, we've been looking how Paul and Barnabas are on this first missionary journey. They have, uh, several chapters ago, have been kind of appointed. Actually, at the beginning of chapter 13, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, as they were praying with the believers in Antioch, they had been told by the Spirit that they is the church, the gathered believers, in the first couple verses of 13. They had been told to set aside Paul and Barnabas for the work to which God had called them. And so they're fasting and they're praying, they're laying the hands on them, and they commission them to go to the work that they've been called to. And that begins this journey that Barnabas and Saul take, where they go to Cyprus and they go to Antioch of Pisidia, and they go to these other communities, Iconium, Lystra, and they go to these places and their number one goal is to go in and share the gospel of Jesus Christ until they're basically kicked out. I mean, that's what happens at each of these locations. They're preaching and preaching, and they're going to the, the synagogues, they're going to the Gentiles, and in every place there's this stirrup that happens, right? There's a challenge to the status quo of those in authority, and so then they're driven out. And so we're seeing that they they seem pretty undaunted, and up till now, it's been a situation where they're able to kind of escape uh, and get out of there before it gets really dangerous. But we're going to read starting in verse 19 today, and we're going to see kind of how this continues. I'm reading out, the, out of the ESV, but given our previous conversation, I feel like I should grab another translation. Yeah, so I I'm have going the ESV. To... <laughs> Just because Linnea said we should read other translations, I am going to put away my it. ESV today, and I'm pulling out the NET, the New English Translation. Wow. And if that's not a sign, I literally <laughs> just opened to the exact right verse. So here we go. So reading out of the NET, we're going to start in verse 19 and read through the end of the chapter. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and after winning the crowds over, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, presuming him to be dead. But after the disciples had surrounded him, he got up, went back into the city. On the next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. After they had proclaimed the good news in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium. And to Antioch, they strengthened the souls of the disciples and encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying, We must enter the kingdom of God through many persecutions. When they had appointed elders for them in the various churches, with prayer and fasting, they entrusted them to the protection of the Lord, in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia, came into Pamphylia, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. When they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported all the things God had done with them, and that he had opened a door of faith for the Gentiles, so they spent considerable time with the disciples. There's a lot going on there. Wow. 
And it's almost like we picked up at kind of the the tail end of one story and then kind of a, a summary yeah. uh, of this first journey. And so it's important to kind of understand how, how did that initial story end? So starting up in verse eight, we, um, we saw that there was, as they entered into Lystra or Lystra, however you want to pronounce that, there was a man who could not use his feet and had been lame from birth, never had walked, and was listening to Paul speaking. And so Paul, he, he heals this man by the power of Jesus Christ. And the, the community thinks, wow, we've got Zeus and Hermes, the mm-hmm. two gods that are with us. And so they begin to worship them and you know sacrifice for them. And they're making this big stir. But Paul and Barnabas are like, no, 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 no. We are men like you. We're not these gods. We do this by the power. And so they proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're trying to kind of get them to to calm down. But then there's a disturbance. There's a a stir up, right? Uh, that they're while they're trying to calm this crowd down, there's others that came from out of town and stirred this whole thing up so that they would be opposed. And so you have, uh, let's see here, it says, yeah, we were proclaiming, this is in verse 15. We were proclaiming good news to you so that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything that's in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without a witness by doing good, by giving you rain from heaven. So, um. They explain all this, but then in 19, we see Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and after winning the crowds over, they stoned Paul. So while Paul and Barnabas had been witnessing and sharing, it was Jews Mm -hmm. from previous communities they'd been at that now heard, okay, Paul and Barnabas are over there. Let's, we got to stop these guys. So then that opposition comes from Antioch and Iconium and other communities, and then we see the result. What what first kind of what do you see here that you go, man? That we ne- might need to unpack that. And that needs a little explaining, or man, that's interesting. Yeah, I think the fact that Paul was stoned and dragged out of the city, supposing that he was dead. So they had hurt him so badly that people thought he was dead. That idea and that picture and the image of that is so foreign to me mm-hmm. and to us, probably all of us where any kind of persecution that we have in America is someone jokes about being a Christian. That's it. But this is, he is laying on the ground and his friends think he's dead. Yeah, you think about the level of brutality that stoning is, where they're literally just picking up big old jagged rocks and hurling them at him. And they're just lancing off of his head and his body and he's basically pummeled with rocks until he is no longer moving Mm -hmm. and you would imagine that they're all watching this and we don't know if this happened to barnabas but we're it's indicated that it was paul that was drag drug out and this was done to him and so it says that he's surrounded by disciples and that's when he gets up Sheesh. You imagine just what an this situation. Yeah. <laughs> you're there, you're watching this. Here he is proclaiming faith. He's yeah. proclaiming the victory of Christ. And then he is just physically pummeled and beat down. They think he's dead. Then he starts moving and he gets up. Rather than go on to the next city, he goes back to where they just tried to kill him. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh. We'd be like, hey, Paul, why don't you sit the next week out? Yeah. Why don't we just chill for a little bit? Yeah. And he gets up and he heads to the next place the next day. It's crazy. It is crazy. And as I, you look at this and it's, it's easy as we read this, we can go pretty fast and we go, he went here and he went here and he yep. went here. But you also think of how much time passes between, like travel time was so different. 
So walking from one place to the next, it was typically like a day's walk journey. And that alone would have been taxing. Yep. The commute. Yep. And and so anything that, you know, you look at that story of Paul in, in Lystra and sharing the good news, confronting idolatry and false worship, and then having to deal with direct opposition to that and then physical persecution emotional trauma for sure physical trauma and then just the will to get up and go back in and face it all over again possibly and then continue on the next day down the road uh how how does this land for like you think back to luke's writing this for theophilus so that he has an accurate account of all that's taken place. How do you think this lands, this particular story lands for someone like that in the first century and they're hearing this story? I think it, for me, if I was Theophilus, I would, uh, I think it would be as traumatic and as tragic as it is that someone would be stoned for this but it would be almost a strengthening of what I believe is worth this. Like Mm -hmm. what Paul just experienced, he believes that it's worth it. And sometimes seeing other people have such strong faith is so encouraging to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so he, he is hearing about this and what happened to Paul. And I just think that it, it would probably be a little bit more personal than it is. It is encouraging for me to read this and know what I believe is worth it. Mm-hmm. But for Theophilus, I mean, that was so much more personal for him. Yeah. As you were speaking, it made me think of Paul's words to the believers in Corinth. Mm-hmm. And like this incident is what is in the backdrop for Paul and even for those that know him, when he says things like, we have this treasure in jars of clay so that the extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are experiencing trouble on every side, but are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are knocked down, but not destroyed. Always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our body. We are constantly, we who are alive are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our mortal body. As a result, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And so he goes on to say that these light and momentary afflictions are preparing for us Mm -hmm. an eternal weight of glory. And what he calls light and momentary yeah. is stoning to death. Crazy. And rejection. Mm-hmm. But you you look at what happens here in Acts 14, and then you flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and you read that, and you see, wow, he was undaunted. Like, that's how he, he framed that kind of physical persecution as this is the exact mm-hmm. reason for why we do this. Yeah. We're beat down so that you can have life. I face death so that the life of Christ can shine through. Mm -hmm. And that while my physical body may face opposition, that's only going to make the life of Christ in me shine brighter so other people go, what drives this guy? Yeah. So that's that's crazy. His whole perspective is eternally focused. Uh I mean, everything. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, where does he, I think it's Philippians where he says. Um, you got to quote it in the NIV because I won't know okay. it if it's. <laughs> um, what's I'm the kidding. quote I'm thinking of? Uh, it has to do with uh, if Christ is for us, who can be against us? And, you know, that to to live is Christ and to die is gain. Yep. Yep. And that he's not released from this body until he does his work. Mm-hmm. So there's almost the sense in which he has such an extreme faith in what God has called him to do mm-hmm. that God won't let him die until he's done, he's completed the task. Yeah, yeah. And you go, I, I, don't, I don't know how I'm gonna get out of this one, but until I'm done, like I won't die. Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> That's it's crazy. Complete faith. That yeah. if, I, if I'm supposed to go, I'm supposed to go. But if I'm supposed to make it through this, God will pull me through it. And he's just 100% faith. And you, you talk about a life that has zero anxiety in it. Oh, man. When, when Paul then <laughs> writes to the Philippians and says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, mm-hmm. present your requests to God in the peace of God, hmm. uh, which surpasses all understanding, will be yours. And you go, okay, this is, like, here's a man who literally, he wasn't anxious about his reputation. He wasn't anxious about his physical body, if he was going to eat. Yeah. Uh, as he's on a ship and he gets shipwrecked and he's not anxious about that. When he gets bitten by a venomous snake, he's not, he's like, look, I've got a task to do Hmm. and God will not let me expire until it's over. Hmm. And so for him, I mean, we have to be clear in this time in human history, God very clearly called Paul to a very specific task. Yep. But I think that that level of open-handedness yep. and faith, I think that's available to us all if we're willing to live with that kind of reckless abandon. Yeah. I've, I've been thinking about this sentiment a lot of the open-handed, especially with our kids. I can be very anxious. And when my kids were babies, I was so anxious just at night and how they were sleeping and are they going to wake up and are they going to be alive when they wake up? And I just remember someone telling me that God has a plan for them mm-hmm. and, and however, whatever he has for them, it's according to his plan. And yep. so we live in light of that truth that God is the author of everything and he is the one who plans it out. Mm-hmm. And so we don't have to stress about these little things not that we won't, but we don't have to because God, he's got it. Yeah, I remember talking to one pastor who had pastored very successfully. He's on the East Coast and he had been in this one community and very successful, flourishing mm-hmm. church. He and his wife wanted to plant a church in New York City. And so someone asked him like, did God tell you to plant a church? And he's like, no, not necessarily. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you know you're supposed to? He goes, well, because I read the scriptures and why wouldn't he want a church yep. in the heart of the city there? So he and his wife go and they're like, well, what if it, what if it fails? What if no one comes? Mm-hmm. And he responded, he said, well, praise be to God, because whatever I do, as long as I am compelled by the spirit of God and his word, and I'm walking in obedience, what seems like uh, from the human perspective as a failure, yep. God is going to use to accomplish a shaping in me and the, it's according to his plan. Yep. So I can't view my success day in and day out on some sort of visual, you know, criteria that comes from humanity. Mm-hmm. I've got to just, it's got to be about faithfulness. Like I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to live the way he says, come what may. Because I'll expire when I'm supposed to, mm-hmm. and and that success is the obedience to yeah. what what you need to do, and yeah. being surrendered to do it. That's the success. The success is not how how big the ministry grows or the church grows or anything like that. It's not measured by our standards at all. Well, and I think that's that's a good segue into the the last portion of this is a summary, right? You go from verse twenty one through 28, and it just kind of summarizes that they had proclaimed the good news in that city, made many disciples, and they, they're just kind of finishing out the tour. They're going to different places, and they're facing persecution, and that they they have this assurance that God had communicated to them at some point that they must enter the kingdom of God through many persecutions. So the road of faith was a road of persecution for them. And they went around and they appointed elders and they laid hands on them. They prayed for them, entrusting them to the Lord. And then they arrive back and they then start talking about, here's, here's what God did. He opened the door here and he opened the door to the faith, you know, faith to the Gentiles and reported all the things God had done with them. Not all the things they had done. 
And so they constantly recognized the primary actor in these things, in these opportunities. It was God. He was opening doors. He was closing doors. Mm -hmm. We went here, we did this, and God brought these people in. And then we went here and God did this. And, and there's this reporting of they just were faithful. Yep. They just they went where God told them. They spoke what God gave them, and they endured because of promises made to them by God. And then they just bragged on all the stuff God had done. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's a powerful place to be. So, good good recap, good summary in that success in the life of a believer. And and we've said this before on the podcast, but it has everything to do with faith and obedience. Yep. That's what it comes down to. It can never be about the numbers or what you've produced. Like at the end of the day, I don't think God's going to say, all right, let's look at your report card and let's look mm-hmm. at how many how many people did you witness to? Yep. What are your numbers looking like? Ooh, you, you didn't hit the quota. He's going to he's going to ask and look at faithfulness. Did yep. you trust me? Yep. When I when I called you to this, good job. You trusted me. It took you a little bit but you got there, right? And so I think that there's going to be more of that conversation. And that's just encouraging that we don't have to have the answers. We just have to have a willingness to show up. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of this section of scripture, what they're doing, they could have come back and shared with the church, this is how God used me, or this is what I did. This is what we did. And it, it, the way that they did describe how, what God had done with them, they moved the main character from themselves and here's what we did and here's the Mm -hmm. success that we had, but they moved it. Here's what God did through us and using us. And that's what I want to do. I don't want to make it all about me. And here's, here's what I'm doing and the success that I'm having, but I just want to be surrendered and say, I think this is what God wants to do. And here, and here's how, you know, like it's, it's just shifting that main character part. Yeah. I do on a side note, I love when it says in verse 23, and when they had appointed elders, so they're going around, they're sharing the faith in these communities, they're uh, telling people about the gospel, people are coming to faith and beginning to be disciples and follow, and then they identify, which the criteria we later know comes in First Timothy and Titus. Yep. Uh, here's 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 qu- who's qualified to be an elder or an overseer. He doesn't ask them like there's no indication he's like, hey, you know, I kind of see some some stuff in you. Why don't you pray and see if God wants you to be an elder? Like, no, Paul's rolling around mm-hmm. going, you're an elder, you're an elder. He's appointing them, and then he's praying and fasting, and saying, we trust you, the Lord. He'll take care of you. Yeah, good luck. And then he moves on. <laughs> he doesn't ask him to like sit and pray about it. He appoints people mm, wow. to leadership, which is funny because we. We have a tendency in in the church world to go, well, hey, we really think you could do this, but why don't you pray about it? Yep. And it's like, well, if it's a good thing and it's a God thing, why wouldn't you do it? Just do it. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> but people are not in that place. They're we gotta gotta be patient. <laughs> yeah. Even I guess that's the epitome of being voluntold when you're you've been voluntold to yes. do something, yep. right? Yep. Well, Linnea, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking and reading the scriptures. Uh, As people listen, if you're tuning in and there's anything that kind of provoked some thoughts, some questions, you can always email me at takeandreadpodcast at gmail.com. If you have any questions or thoughts for Linnea, you can email that email address and I'll get that to her and she would be happy to respond. And again, in the comment section, if you're tuning in on YouTube or some other place that has another platform that has comments, that's a great place for the community of Take and Read uh, to engage in dialogue and and converse about these passages and and these truths and how you're applying them and what maybe what your practice is when you uh, come across a new translation or things that maybe Linnea shared or stuff that's going on in the text. But I want to encourage the community of the Take and Read movement uh, to engage in that kind of conversation. It's a great place to do it. And again, you've watched or you have observed and heard two people who have encountered Jesus Christ and have not recovered from that encounter. And we believe this to be his inspired word. We believe this is the revelation of who God is that he's given us. And that this, this thing in front of us, this book, is unlike any other book. It's divine in every way. 
and it is providing for us all that we need for life and for godliness and how to live a flourishing existence here on earth. And so that's what we believe, and this is the book we live by. So I want to encourage everybody out there to go take and read the Word of God. Blessings. Blessings.